Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It doesn't get out of fashion to say that to people. Right? Don't hear many people say it anymore. I find even in the store or something. But if you say it to them, they'll say it back. Well, just a couple of things. Uh, there is a kids' club this week, and it is a kids' Christmas party, kids' club Christmas party. So come along, and uh, if you have children under five, uh, bring them, but bring yourself with them mm -hmm. so we can manage. And uh, we'll have a few little gifts for them, and we'll have lots of fun together. Um, what else? Next Sunday, our service next Sunday is going to be incorporating a little bit of a concert. So there's going to be some different people singing, hopefully. Uh, and on top of that, yeah, we hope to have the kids all sing too. So I'm going to try and pull them together for a practice this week. We're going to do a little song called Christmas is a Time for Love. So they can play shakers and drums and sing. and Yeah, so that's uh, in the works. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, okay, just to let you know ahead of time. We will have a Christmas Eve service, okay? And uh, that is all compliance with the Nova Scotia reg regulations right now. Of course, things could change, but that's the plan. So it'll be a Christmas Eve service. And I think we usually have that around 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve. So, um, yeah, I don't think I have any other announcements. No. Whoever is going upstairs, there's some kids' pages up there, coloring pages and stuff for them to be able to do. So, um, yeah. Let's stand and sing. You next there? Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, was born on Christmas Day. A man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. A long time ago in Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible say. Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, was born. Christmas Day. Hark now, hear the angels sing. King was born today. And a man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, they see a bright new shining star. Joseph and his wife Mary came to Bethlehem that night. They found no place to bear her child, not a single room was inside. Then they found a little place in a stable all forlorn, and in the manger of Christmas Day. For a moment the world was aglow, 
All the bells rang out, there were tears of joy and laughter. People shouted, let everyone know, there is hope for all to find peace. Oh my Lord, you sent your Son to save us, oh my Lord. Your very self you gave us, oh my Lord. That sin may not enslave us and love may reign once more. Oh my Lord, when in the grip they found him, oh my Lord, a golden halo crowned him, oh my Lord, they gathered all around him to see him and adore. Oh my Lord, with the child's adoration, oh my Lord, there came great jubilation, oh my Lord, and full of admiration, they realized what they had. When the sun falls on the sky, oh my Lord, the they water. have just begun to doubt you, oh my Lord. The what did they you. know about you, oh my Lord? The but Lord. they were lost without you, they needed you so bad. The light is shining on us, oh my Lord. So with the child's adoration, oh my Lord. There came great jubilation, oh my Lord, and full of admiration they realized what they had. Oh my Lord, you sent your Son to save us, oh my Lord, your very self you gave us, oh my Lord, that sin may not enslave us and love may reign once more. Um, Lord, we thank you for the, the privilege that it is to meet together this morning, Lord, to worship you and um, to praise you, to learn, um, and to love you, Lord. Pray that your spirit be present here this morning, um, Lord, that you be glorified, and um, that you change hearts here. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
see this baby wrapped in life, a host of angels led them all to Julia. It was just as the angel said, you'll find him in a manger bed, Emmanuel, and say, The 
Son of God to die on the cross for our sin. Christ was paid in full, peace with God restored for everyone who comes to Him. We still shout hallelujah we still sing glory in the highest we still believe in the name of jesus peace on earth good will to men so this christmas time as we celebrate Christ has come into the world and so even now if you trust in him he will come into your heart we still shout on earth good will to men we still shout hallelujah we still sing glory in the highest we still believe in the name of Jesus Amen. 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 Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we rejoice in such an awesome Savior as this? God is so good. Alan, there's a few more people coming. They might need some chairs at the back there. So. Silent night, oh, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yonder, virgin mother and child, holy infant so Thank you. 
get to sing Christmas carols that often do we so we should blast a few of them this morning before Christmas is over again this song is an old song God rest ye merry gentlemen but you could really say God rest to all of to every one of us right this is not just the gentleman is it I hope not no no for sure but, well we need to stand and sing this and why don't you clap along because it's a great little Christmas tree. God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of Thank you for answering. Yeah. 
I don't see Lammy. Lammy's always a little bit late. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Hey, Lammy, what you got there? Well, what does it look like? Well, it looks like toilet paper to me. Here, are you going to help with that? What are you doing with that anyway? Well, I, I'm trying to make a list of everything I want for Christmas. Yeah? And I couldn't find any paper long enough for it, so I, uh, I got a roll of toilet paper. And I'm going to write all the stuff I want for Christmas on here. It's going to be a long list. It's going to go way down. I'm going to use the whole roll. Yes. Lammy, what are you thinking of? Well, you know, I need a lot of stuff. <laughs> hey, you're taking away from my roll. I'm going to put this down before he takes it all. Yeah. There. Oh, boy. my That's a kind of heavy thing, but I, I, I don't think I'm going to run out of pens for it because I'm going to put oh so much stuff on that list. Oh, I can just imagine what I'm going to get for Christmas. I'm going to have a, a, a big, 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 big bale of alfalfa. I'm going to have a new bed. I'm going to have a stereo. I'm going to have a... Uh, well, why don't I get a brand new car? What do you mean a brand new car? Well, you know, a brand new car would be nice. You don't even have a license. Oh, I never thought of that. Well, do they let lambs drive? No, they don't. Oh. Uh, well, how about a brand new tricycle? Ha! There, a new bike for me. Have you ever ridden a bike? No, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to ride a bike. Well, why would you want a new one? I want everything for Christmas. Everything. Everything? Yeah, that's what Christmas is all about. Get some more stuff, more toys, more things, more everything, and it makes you so happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know if that's true. Is that true? No. No. So does anybody want anything for Christmas? Do you, you want a lot of stuff or some stuff? Some. Oh, you don't want enough to fit on a roll of toilet paper, do you? No. No. Why not? Why, if you're going to get one thing, why don't you get a thousand things? That's my philosophy. Uh, Lammy, do you remember last Christmas? Uh, let me think now. Nope, I can't remember one thing about last Christmas. Well... If you can't remember anything from last Christmas, okay. Whoops. Out. Watch out, you don't get bit. <laughs> if you can't remember anything from last Christmas, well, um, it doesn't really matter, does it? Hey, you're right. I don't remember one thing I got last year. So it doesn't bring you real happiness, does it? Nope, it doesn't bring you real happiness. Well, what's the big deal about Christmas then if it's not getting presents? Does anybody know? What's Christmas all about? Jesus. What did you say? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's about Jesus. Yeah, he's the best present of all. Well, if he's a present, how do I open him up? Is he under the tree? No, he's not under the tree. He's everywhere. But if you pray to him and ask him to come into your heart, he will come in. And he'll bring you joy that will be for every day of the year. Oh. Yeah. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave. That's a gift. His only son, Jesus. If anybody believes in him, they will not perish but have everlasting life. That means being with God forever. Wow, that's awesome. Oh, so I don't need a roll of toilet paper for all the gifts. Nope, you don't. <laughs> oh, the best gift of all is Jesus? He's the bestest, bestest gift of all. Oh, boy. Well, I'm getting excited about Christmas more than I was before. I guess I'll use the toilet paper for something else. Yeah, probably so. Well, I hope everybody here 
accepts Jesus as their Savior, because if you don't, you're going to miss Christmas. I almost missed it. I got all thinking about all the presents. And the presents are still good, though. Aren't, aren't they? Yep, the presents are still good. You can still get presents under the tree, but don't forget about who? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, don't forget about him. Well, you want to go get milked? No, I don't get milked. You get milked. Oh, yeah, that's right. I got, I got confused. Okay, well, why don't we go? Hey, maybe there's some eggnog around. Hey, you know what? When they make eggnog, they use milk in it. Oh, they do, do they? And they must put eggs in it, too. Yep, they put eggs. It's really good. Well, maybe the farmer's got some made from my milk. It's better than the store. Is it really? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, let's go and we'll get milked and maybe we'll have some eggnog. <laughs> Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! And don't forget about Jesus! Yeah. Oh, boy. This way. Thank you. See, I guess. Mm -hmm. Before we go to the word, we're going to sing one more song, and it's uh, um, "You Did Leave Your Throne," or the old king, the old song when it was originally written, said, "Thou didst leave thy throne." But I figured I'd take the thous and the these out, so. <laughs> so let's stand and sing this before we go to God's Word. You did leave your throne and your kingly crown When you came to earth for me But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for your holy nativity? Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. Heaven's arches rang when the Set 
scorn and with crown of thorns they bore you to shall ring and the angels sing at your coming in victory let your voice call me home saying yet there is room there is room at my side for thee my heart shall rejoice This morning as we consider a Christmas message, I want to ask the question, why Jesus? Why is Jesus so important? Lots of people have come and gone in the world. I don't know how many billions altogether, but there's been a few. And there's lots of people in the pages of history that you could think about and talk about. People who were famous, Julius Caesar, Caesar for one, and Cleopatra and all kinds of characters down through the history of the world, great generals who, um, Alexander the Great, one of them, who fought wars and people who were people of peace who tried to do things to, to uh, facilitate peace in the world. There's been lots of people, lots of presidents and prime ministers and kings and rulers Great kings like King David, who ruled and ruled well. But why Jesus? Why does Jesus stand out over the history, pages of the history of time? Why is he so special? He was a great teacher. Lots of people have studied what he has to say. Even people who don't believe in God still acknowledge that whoever wrote these words, the great teacher, whoever said them, he was a miracle worker, but there were miracles in the Old Testament too, weren't there? Yes. Moses was there at the parting of the Red Sea. Moses was there when he struck the rock and water came gushing out. Lots of miracles. But then he died on a cross. So he died. Well, everybody does that too, don't they? Last I heard, pretty well everybody dies. But he died a cruel death. Well, have other people died cruel deaths? Yes. Sure have. There are people who are dying deaths now. There's some cruel deaths happening in the United States of America right now. And I think we're just going to pause and pray for families and people in the circumstances that they're in right now with these tornadoes that have swept through huge swaths. Father, we come to you, and it is a broken world. And because it's a broken world, there are terrible circumstances that happen, and this is one of them. And so we come to you and we ask you, O oh God, to meet people where they are. Lord, there are some that are believers in you and they are clinging to you in the midst of the darkness. There are others, Lord, who don't know who you are and they don't know what to do. And I pray they would turn to you and find comfort and strength. We pray for those who might be still buried beneath the rubble alive, and we ask you to give wisdom to the rescuers to find them. And we pray, Lord, that you will touch their lives in the midst of this dark hour. Come to them, Lord, we pray. And Lord, we understand that death comes to all. We also understand we have no idea when any of us will go. And so, Lord, if Jesus Christ is really who he says he is, and if there's an eternity beyond, which there truly and surely is, then, oh, Lord, how people need to get ready. Because our time here is short, and we have no idea when it will come to an end. And we look at this world and we see things, pressures increasing across the globe, whether it's with the ecology or the economy, or whether it's with health, with coronavirus, and who knows what else, we see pressures mounting across the globe. 
And it ought to remind us, Lord, that you have prophesied that many of these things would come in the end of the age. And we may very well be experiencing this now. And yet, Lord, we hustle and bustle about with our eyes closed and our ears plugged to you. Oh, God, open our eyes. Those who do not know you as their Savior, open their eyes before it's too late to understand that you need Jesus Christ. And those who are your own, Lord, let us not be buried in the distractions of this world and miss what's happening around us and miss the reality that what really matters is to walk with God. So, Lord, as we continue in your word this morning, we cry out. We cry out for people. We cry out for people in our own village and across the globe that, Lord, as stresses strain and mount, that people will turn to the Lord before it's too late. And may our hearts be turned towards you in a fresh way this morning and understand who this Jesus really is and what it is to walk with you. We ask for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So yeah, he's a great teacher, he's a miracle worker, but he died on a cross. Many people died for their causes. People die for causes all the time. There's been thousands and thousands of martyrs through the history of the world, some of them dying for good reason and others dying just to kill others. People who put bombs on themselves and strap themselves with them and go in and, and destroy others. Why is Jesus so special? Well, the answer is, is because he's God. Because he's God. That's the difference between Jesus Christ and every other person that has ever lived. He's not just, we use the term the Son of God, thinking that maybe he's less than God. But no, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus Christ is God himself, that there is a God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And these are not negotiable truths. There is the Father and there is the Son. And the Bible tells us one of his titles is Mighty God. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Counselor. Mighty God. Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. That's one of his titles. Did you get that? That's one of his titles. The Prince of Peace. In Micah chapter 5, it says, Out of you... Who's come out of Bethlehem has come a ruler who's been of old, who has been from everlasting. This is God. This is nobody less than God. And listen, I want you to know something. For the redemption of the human race, for the redemption of your own soul, there is no one except Jesus Christ that can fill, fit the bill. All the people down through history, the greatest ones, the ones who tried to make peace, the ones who were uh, great orators, the ones who were, ran, governed great armies, whoever they were, no one could win the day. I think it's in the book of Ezekiel, it says, God said, I looked for one to stand in the gap, and I found no one. No one. Not amongst all of the human race could there be found someone who could bring hope and peace and an eternal destination for the human race. No one could. So God had to send. Father had to send the Son. God had to descend into this world to save you. And that is why the virgin birth, that is that Mary conceived Jesus Christ without a man, is a cardinal doctrine in the Word of God. Because otherwise, he was just one other man who looked like any other. And if he died on a cross, so what? Many have. The Romans crucified hundreds of thousands of people. They put them to death. So there's no hope found in any of those other crucifixions. No, none of those other ones can redeem your soul. The only reason why this one can redeem your soul is because he is God. Now, that does two things. One, it makes him exclusive. That is why he could say with boldness in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. 
That's why he has the right to be exclusive. That's why it doesn't matter how many religions there are in the world or how many people make up religions and all the things that come with it. None of them are going to matter. At the end of the day, it is Jesus Christ that matters. It is the fact that God became a man. It is the fact that at one point in time, he was conceived within the womb of Mary, was born in a stable in Bethlehem, and grew up as one of us, became a great teacher and miracle worker, and was crucified for your sins. That is what's vital. Let's read a little bit of the Christmas story here, Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. Not by man. That is why he was called the Son of God. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Joseph didn't understand this. How can this be? She got pregnant. Well, now, as far as I know, if somebody gets pregnant, there's somebody else involved, right? Made sense for Joseph to think that, don't you think? But while he thought about these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, for your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. It was a work of God. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, which means God who saves. And that's why it says, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means God who saves. He will save his people from their sins. And so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and they will bear a son, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. God with us. So God who saves is God with us. <coughs> Excuse me. Those are the titles of Jesus. And Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. And this is uh, the prophecy was written 600 years before in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Which means what? God with us. God who saves, God with us, this is the one. And he did not know her. She brought forth her firstborn son, and she called his name Jesus. And so the Christmas story is wrapped around the greatest story of all, that God stepped into the human race. In the Old Testament, it says that the nations are like a drop in a bucket to God. That's all, like a drop in the bucket. That's what the nations are like. And then it also says that we are like grasshoppers on a plane in the sight of God. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were walking in a field and you saw a bunch of grasshoppers, you might take notice of them, and you might start to dance and say, you get me out of here. Or you might try to step on a few of them. I don't know. But maybe if they were bugs like ants and they started crawling up your leg, you probably wouldn't say, oh, come on up here, you know. You, you, you would likely do something about it. It's like my poor cousin one time years ago in those bad old days, we were hitchhiking from PEI and... We landed in Port Hawkesbury at 2 o'clock in the morning after having ridden on the back of a truck from the ferry. And uh, we crawled up into the woods to go to sleep. And there we were. Uh, I remember the last thing my cousin said. He said, oh boy, he said, I got a good spot here. He said, there's just like a piece of ground here, just like a pillow. So... That's the last I heard him say, until about maybe two hours later, just as day was breaking, I heard him jumping up, and I won't say the kind of words he was saying, but he was going like this with his sleeping bag, and there was rivers of ants coming out of them. And he was bit to pieces. He put his head on an anthill. Imagine. 
When the Lord says we are just like ants or grasshoppers or bugs in his sight. Now, I don't know how fond you are of bugs. Some people are. But most people, you know, they try to get rid of bugs, don't they? But God doesn't try to get rid of us. We are like bugs in the sight of a mighty, powerful, awesome God who could have stamped us all out in a moment, and especially because we're a bunch of bugs that are trying to bite God. We're against God. We rebel against Him. He gives us good things to do. He gives us a way to live, and we reject it. He says, this is the right way to go. Take this path. Take this path. No, no, we know better. You're, you're out to get us. We don't even believe in you. And we reject him time and time again. And nobody in this room is exempt from that kind of thinking. All of us have been there. But God is great and full of mercy. And he looks at us and he has compassion on us. So what does he do? Does he just come down and kind of try to lift us up? Does he say, okay, bugs, I'll give you more food. I'll give you more of this. I'll give you more of that. No, he sees the rebellion of your heart. He sees the rejection in your soul. And he still loves you. He's still compassionate towards you. He's full of compassion towards the human race. So he takes the ultimate step. And he says, okay, I will leave the halls of heaven. I will leave the power and the authority and the glory that is all mine here. And I will come down and I'll become one of them. How would you like to become a bug? Huh? That is what Jesus did for you and for me. He came to be with us, God with us. This was startling. It was even amazing to the angels. The Bible said angels desired to look into the things that God was doing with the human race, especially in regards to his only son, especially in regards to the one who created all things. And yet he, being the divine creator, Jesus, yes, it was Jesus that knelt on the ground and formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. It was Jesus. The Bible says without Jesus Christ, there was nothing made that was made. That God would send his son to be conceived within the womb of Mary. And of course, I think to make it so clear to the humility and the downward step that Jesus Christ had taken, he made sure that Jesus was born in a barn. He made sure that it wasn't in king's palaces. He made sure that it wasn't in some glorious place. But no, it was in a stinking barn. Now most barns, stables, they have a little bit of odor to them. If you have not been around a barn with animals, they do. So sometimes we sanitize it all and we make it look like a really glorious spot, you know. But no, this was like the lowest of provision that they could find. This was all they had. No room in the inn for them. You know, God allowed that. God arranged it. That there was not even room in a regular, for a regular bed for, for, for Christ to be born. God permitted it because he wants you to understand that he comes to the lowest place. And I want to tell you something, friends. There's no lower place in the universe than your heart and mine. That's the lowest place of all. That's the smelliest place of all because of the stink of our own sin, because of what we have done, because of the utter rebellion of our own hearts. And yet, God loves us. And He comes to us. He comes to you and me. And he comes to transform us from the inside out. And he comes to make us sweet smelling instead of with the stench of sin. And that is his mercy and his grace. So Luke 2, 7 says, She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. There was no room for them in the inn. Now they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. 
And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. You've heard the story before, right? And yet, here we have as well, God saying, okay, I, I, he does things backwards as far as we're concerned. I mean, if God was going to come to earth, wouldn't he come in chariots of fire? Wouldn't he proclaim to the world, here I am, now listen to me? But no, what did he do? He became one of us, but he also not only became one of us, but he came in the lowest place, to the poorest of the poor, to the homeless. They were homeless. Joseph and Mary, they had no home. They had to live in a barn. That's, the, that's who he came to. That's who he loves. And then what does he do? Does he say, okay, I want the greatest heralds. I want the kings and the queens to all come and proclaim. No, no he starts with shepherds. He starts with the lowest group of people. The people who are considered to be, you know, low class. Because they weren't educated. And they smelled like sheep, the back end of a sheep. And they lived in the fields with their sheep. But God sends the angels of heaven to them. He sends it to them. What about you? Are you humble enough to say, Lord, come to me? Lord, come into this heart. Lord, do what you want with me. Lord, I might be a smelly stable, but I need you, Lord. Lord, I might be the lowest class of all, but that's okay. You come to those kind of people. You come to the brokenhearted. You come to the ruined. You come to the, to the ones that are at the bottom of the pole, not the top. But you know why? Because the ones at the top wouldn't come to them anyway. Too proud. We think we are good enough. We think we are able enough. And often, it is the most religious people that are the worst kind. I'm not exaggerating. It's true. We have the evidences already in because the most religious people of all were the ones who crucified Jesus Christ. They're the ones who put him to death. So God didn't, still didn't leave himself without a witness. He still had the angels proclaim in the midst of all of that, in the place of humility, the angels appeared. They didn't appear in Jerusalem at the great temple and blow trumpets and announce the birth of Jesus. And now we find that these, later on, it says, now when the, where the, uh, the wise men came, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, this was two years afterwards, by the way, just about two years later. They didn't come to a stable. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with, great, with exceeding great joy after they had gone to Jerusalem and looked for it, and then they saw it. When they come into the house, not a stable, if you didn't notice that, they saw the young child, not the baby, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. So even there, God wanted it to make known that even the kings of the earth worship, will worship Jesus. I want you to know something, that you will worship Jesus. If you are the most blatant atheist, maybe you're watching or listening to this program and you're thinking, well, I'm an atheist and I'm just going to see how stupid this guy is that's speaking. You will bow down and you will worship God. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you may not worship him now. And you may think, I can go my own way. I'll do my own thing, and I'll take a little bit of God. Well, how about if I just believe a little bit about God? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll accept some things, but I'm not going to accept it all because I'm my own person. I'll tell you where you'll be. You'll be your own person in hell. Because God sent his son to die for you, and either you accept him in, no conditions on your part, you humble yourself and accept him in, or he's not going to be in, and you'll be lost for eternity. You can go to hell with all kinds of knowledge about God, and you can know it's all true and still be lost. 
Because it's not enough to know that it's true. You must do something about it. Herod knew it was true. So much so that he sent soldiers to try and kill that baby. So knowing that it's true is not enough. So they came and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold and frankincense and myrrh. They gave their best to the master. What are you doing? Are you giving him leftovers? Are you giving him your best? How crazy. They spent two years from the time they saw that star, almost two years, when they saw that star in the sky, and they knew that star represented that, Jesus, that the Savior had come. That, and they considered him to be God because they came and worshipped him. And furthermore, they spent two years of their life traveling to get there, to pack up and go, and who knows how long to go back. They gave away so much to be there and took the best gifts they had, the most expensive, and poured them out at his feet, and they worshipped him, and they thought it was worth it. They were wise. Are you? Are you wise? Or are you foolish? They were wise. Yes. Matthew 1, 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and he bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Why, Jesus? Because he is God, but not just because he's God, because he is God with us. He's with us. God has come into the human race, and God has taken humanity and the wonder of this is that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead after he was crucified, he took humanity into heaven. He's still with the human race. The Bible says he still intercedes for us. And he loves us with such a passion, a love that was born out in the fact that he would die for your sins and mine, but also that he would commit himself to humanity for eternity. He's God with us. God is with the human race. And I know people have said when catastrophe strikes, such as happened just yesterday, where's God? If there was a God, he wouldn't, none of these things would happen. Is that true? No. God has given humanity choices, and God has warned humanity over and over again, you will reap the consequences of your choices. And the choices that were made by humanity have brought us to where we are today. And they will bring us to the place, if you think this is bad, just wait. This, Jesus spoke about some of the catastrophes that would come upon this world. And he said, they are just the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. But I want you to know this. The deepest and most horrible trials that come upon this world are nothing to be compared to hell itself. And so God causes us to discover that when we walk in sin and rebellion against God, there are consequences, and it is His good grace that does it so that we might be warned we need to turn to the living God. And yet people go on their way just a little longer, just a little further in the wrong direction. Which way are you going today? Where are you? God has come to be with us. He's come to be with you and with me. So why Jesus? Because he's God with us. But not only that, my friends, if you are willing to be with God... If you are truly willing to be with God, then not only do you have God with us, but then you end up being with God. And if you are with God, then you discover that not only is God with us, but God is for us. If God wasn't for us, he would never have taken that descent to become one of us. He would never have permitted himself to be born in a barn. He would never have permitted himself to be beaten and cruelly mocked and whipped and put on a cross. Why would he do such a thing? He did it because he's for us. Because he's for the human race. In general, God is for humanity, not against it. We are the ones who have been against God. We're not for God. We've been against God. Every one of us have. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what is this? 
It is God is with us. Now, what will you do with that? Here's Romans 8.31 says, as it speaks about the love of God and it speaks about the, the, the wonder of who God is. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So if you trust Christ as your Savior, wow, He's for you. Now, He's for the human race, but you need to repent. You need to trust Him. If you don't, then you're on your own. He's with us. He wants to be for us, but He wants to go further than that. He wants to be in us, in us. Yes, Christ came into the world to save sinners. But he wants to go a lot farther than that. Because you can go to Bethlehem now. You can go and find supposedly the cave that Jesus was born in. Maybe it is. I don't know. However, he wants you to come to a better place than that. You might get a thrill if you stood in that cave and think, just think, 2,000 years ago, the baby Jesus was here. Or you might walk the shores of Galilee and said, maybe Jesus' footprints are right where mine were. Oh, that makes me feel kind of close to him. But in the meantime, the king of the universe has sent the Spirit of God to come and be in us. So you don't have to go to Galilee to find Jesus. You don't have to go to the temple at Jerusalem or the cave or stable that Jesus was born in but you can have God in you. The king of the universe living inside of you. That's what the word of God teaches. So the descent of Jesus Christ was so amazing because not only did God send his son into the world, but he sends his son into your heart. That's how far God goes. He'd never be able to come into your heart if he hadn't come into the world. But he has come all the way for you and for me. That's the Christmas story. That's why Jesus, because he's the only savior. He's the only one who died for your sins. He's the only one who has accomplished what needs to be accomplished to make room for God in your life. You can't have God in your life and not have your sin dealt with. Don't you think that you can go on sinning and say, oh, I'll take Jesus and we'll just go along and sin merrily. No, you can't. And that is why a Savior had to come. That is why there was no one else that could do it. Because only Jesus Christ could die for your sins and mine. Only He could clear the clutter. Only He could take the sin away so that the Savior could come. And so He comes to live in us. Colossians 1.27, to them, God will to make known one of the richest. Now listen to this. This is the richest of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. That's us, by the way. This is a glorious thing. It was a mystery, but now it's revealed. Which is what? Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. That's the hope of glory. So yes, you can celebrate Christmas, that Christ came into the world. You can even believe it's all true, but has he come into you? That's the question. Have you been born again of the Spirit of God? If you have not, you're so lost. You're dreadfully, terribly, hopelessly lost. And unless that transaction has happened in your life, you are out of it. And all your knowledge will only make it worse in hell. Because the suffering of hell... The Bible tells us is based on how much you know and how much you reject. I don't know if you knew that. There are degrees of suffering there. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? John 15, 4, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. There's a life to be lived. There's a glorious life as you abide. That means remain in me, Jesus says, and I remain in you. There's a place of blessing. It's togetherness. 
Paul writes, I've been crucified with Christ. It's not my life any longer. I is no longer I who lives, but now Christ lives in me and the life which in I live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, Christ lives in me. He lives in me. Does he live in you? Do you understand that for, in order for Christ to live in you, you've got to die. You've got to be willing to say it's not my life anymore. No, we want to run our own lives. We'll do our own thing. Thank you very much. We don't mind a little bit of God here and there, but we'll do our own thing. Thank you very much. Well, that is a recipe for disaster. That has been proven over and over again. 1 John 4, 13 says, By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He's given us of His Spirit. John 14, 17 says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. Are you one of the ones who neither sees God or knows God? Are you one of those? Well, you can. If you cry out to him today, he will reveal himself to you. But you know him, Jesus says to his disciples. For he dwells with you. He dwells with you. What's he talking about? Himself. He said he dwells with you, but he will be what? He will be in you. Is he in you today? Have you trusted in Jesus? Why Jesus? Because there's no place else to go. There is nowhere else to turn. Lord, to whom shall we go? Says Peter. You have the words of eternal life and we believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Nope. Let's go that way. Thank you. That's a good boy. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You're the Son of the living God. Only, only, only Jesus. And so we come to this famous verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, listen, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn you. Jesus didn't come to do that. So that the world through him might be saved. Through him you can be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. Did you get that? But he who does not believe is condemned already. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. Yeah. Our sin has brought us into condemnation. Why are we all not? Why is it that people are condemned already? Because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's not complicated today. This is the reality. Why Jesus? Because he's the only way. He's the only one. Because he's God. Because he has come to be with us. Because he is for us. And because he's come to live in us. What will you do with Jesus? Oh, may it be so that you will come and worship. And come and see who he really is. And put your trust in him today. That's my prayer for every one of us. As we consider Christmas and all that it entails... Don't miss the reality of God with us, God for us, and God in us. Amen. Let's close with a song. So, this is a song we've sung before. Come and see. Uh, but it's usually centered around the crucifixion. But in this one, I just took the words and rewrote it for a Christmas song. So did this last night so I don't know how it's gonna go maybe I got the chords in the wrong place but... <laughs> come and see come and see come and see the King of love see the Creator lying helpless sing, shepherds come, wise men see a shining star, such a humble place for God to One.
your glory laid aside for you were crucified to suffer for our sins yes born to die we
close in prayer for us. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you came for us. You died on the cross for us, Lord, to be with you forevermore. And I just thank you, Lord, for all of you've done for us. Just bless our time as we fellowship and bless our week, Lord, as we just look to you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.